I'll be reading from Luke 23, verse 56, to Luke 24, verse 12. Uh, then, then they returned and prepared the spices and ointments. On the Sabbath day they rested according to the commandment. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. And they, they had found that the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let me add my uh, warmest of Easter Sunday greetings to, to Willie's. Um, my name is Johnny. I'm the pastor and part of the leadership team here at Hebron, and it is really great to have you with us as we celebrate uh, Easter Sunday together. Um, as, as Willie mentioned, um, and as Elijah read, we're going to be looking together at uh, part of the end of Luke's account of uh, Jesus' life. It'd be helpful if you do have a Bible with you, whether a physical paper uh, Bible or on a device, if you could have that open in front of you uh, whilst I speak, that would be a help to me uh, and I trust to you as we spend time thinking about it together. Um, what we also need is God's help um, as we consider his word, and so I'm going to ask for that help now. Let's come to it together in prayer um, before we think about uh, Luke chapter 24. Let's pray. The psalmist writes, the unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. Lord, we thank you that in a world that is often confusing, that your word does bring clarity. And so we ask that as we think about that word together this morning, you would please bring that clarity home to each one of us. Clarity, most of all, that the resurrection of Jesus really happened. More even than that, that the resurrection of Jesus had to happen. We ask these things in his name's sake. Amen. Amen. He is not here, but he has risen. Wonderful Easter words, aren't they? Famous words, perhaps some of the most famous ever spoken, and words that take us right to the heart of the Christian faith. But one question that, that hangs over them, I think, and, and, and has done really ever since they were first uttered, is wonderful and famous though they may be, are they true words? I can make that question a bit more personal, actually. Do you believe that they are true words? Are you certain that Jesus Christ really did physically rise from the dead? That may well be quite a searching question for a number of us this morning. If you're here and would consider yourself to be a Christian, I do hope your sense is that this is a very happy day. Uh, that Easter Sunday is a day of celebration, uh, rightly so, in the Christian calendar. But I do wonder how sure-footed you feel about that celebration. How certain you are that Jesus really did rise from the dead. Or whether, perhaps, you tend to oscillate a bit. Sometimes you think it probably did happen. But others, well, you aren't quite so sure I mean, can anyone really be certain, after all, of, of something quite as outrageous, something as miraculous as resurrection from the dead? Or perhaps you, you wouldn't describe yourself as a Christian. Maybe you're here because it's Easter Sunday, and it seemed like a good thing to do to come to church on Easter Sunday morning. If that is you, you are most welcome here. You're welcome every Sunday of the year, and I really do mean that. 
But I wonder if for you this kind of question might sound quite strange. Uh, are you certain about this key claim of the Christian faith? Because isn't certainty sort of antithetical to the Christian faith? It's in the name, isn't it? We call it the Christian faith. Christianity is all about faith. It's about trust, not about certainty, we might think. And so perhaps you feel that blind faith is as far as we can go when it comes to the claims of Christianity, that some people, perhaps the more gullible among us, are willing to believe it, to have faith, or perhaps even the more desperate among us are willing to believe it. But others of us are more realistic about life. And Easter Sunday's case in point, isn't it? Because frankly, people just don't rise from the dead. Well, the reason I begin with that thought this morning, with the idea of certainty about the resurrection, is that that is exactly the kind of ground that Luke, the author of the gospel account we've read from this morning, would have us on. See, he didn't write his account of Jesus' life as a myth, or as a legend, or as a metaphor. He wrote an eyewitness account. And he wrote it very particularly to give his readers certainty. He says that explicitly. He doesn't hide his motives at all. He says it right at the beginning of his whole account. Let me read just a couple of verses from the very beginning of Luke's account of Jesus' life. Luke says this, It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Luke wants his readers to have certainty in the truth of what he's telling them about Jesus Christ. And that means that certainty, I take it, is a legitimate objective for us when it comes to the Christian faith. And actually, that that much is borne out, rather, by the, the content of his resurrection account. Seems clear that Luke wants us to be certain that the resurrection really did happen, that it had to happen even. And so certainty is going to be our goal this morning as we spend just a few minutes thinking about it together. Let's do that firstly under the heading, be certain that the resurrection of Jesus really happened though no one expected it to. Let me take you back one slide. That's not very clear. But I wonder, even from that slightly grainy picture, if anyone can tell me what that creature is. A platypus. Very well done through a grainy picture. That's super. That is a duck-billed platypus. And if you can just about make it out, they are fairly amazing-looking things, aren't they? When the European explorers first saw the duck-billed platypus, they sent a skin of a platypus home to the UK to prove what they'd seen. And the people who saw it weren't really sure what to make of it. One biologist, a man called George Shaw, was sent a platypus, uh, uh, well, a skin rather, at the end of the 18th century from a colleague in Australia. And frankly, he did not believe that it was the real deal. Because you see, it wasn't unknown at that stage for explorers to fake discoveries of weird and wonderful creatures. But the problem was that people back home were so caught up with the excitement of of seeing new and exotic creatures from lands on the other side of the world that they wanted to believe they existed. And a lot of them tended to fall for all sorts of hoaxes. But when Shaw first saw the skin of the platypus, he said this, it naturally excites the idea of some deceptive preparation by artificial means. See, he was being paid by the word there, if you put it in another way, it looks like a fake. That's what he's saying. He thought it had been stitched together using the bill of a duck with a beaver's body and an otter's feet. You can sort of see why, can't you, as you look at the picture. It wasn't until Shaw had examined the, 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 the skin he'd been sent, he'd stripped back the fur, that he was satisfied there were no stitches. He could finally believe this is the real deal. Now, when we come to the the accounts, the biblical accounts of Jesus' life, we might sometimes be tempted to think of the disciples or of the first witnesses to to events like the resurrection as being sort of simple and, and, and gullible people. 
Perhaps even that they had a, a predisposition to believe that the resurrection would happen. A bit like simple people back home in the UK longing for weird and wonderful creatures to be found in more exotic parts of the world. But when you look closely at the text of Luke's account, that clearly is just not the case. Walk through with me for a moment, if you would. Notice, for a start, at the beginning of chapter 21, verse 1, that on Resurrection Sunday morning, some women appear at the tomb of Jesus carrying spices to anoint his dead body. Now, that is not something you do if you're expecting not to find a body, if you're expecting Jesus to be alive. You don't bring spices to anoint a dead body to a live person, not least least because those kinds of spices cost a lot of money. They clearly think Jesus is dead. As they arrive at the tomb, they find it open and empty, verse 3. And if they're expecting the resurrection to happen, perhaps even hoping that the resurrection would happen, this is surely the point at which they get the party poppers out. But instead, we read verse 4, they were perplexed. Again, hardly the reaction of people who are expecting, even hoping, to see something miraculous. It isn't just uh, the women who arrived at the tomb who need convincing. After speaking with the angels at the empty tomb, the women returned to the rest of Jesus' followers to tell them what has happened. At which point, verse 11, if you look with me, they all believed it straight away without question. No, that isn't what it says, is it? Verse 11, these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. Or as another translation has it, these words seemed to them nonsense. See, it's pretty clear that in the culture Luke was writing into, there was no more expectation that a resurrection would or could happen than there would be today. Just like George Shaw, even after receiving first-hand evidence that Jesus has risen, his disciples still need some convincing, don't they? And yet, what's also clear from what Luke tells us is that that disbelief, it flies in the face of the evidence that is actually available to them. Evidence that confirms, firstly, that on Good Friday, Jesus was definitely dead. Our thoughts at Easter weekend often move straight from the horror of the cross on Good Friday to the resurrection on Easter Sunday. But not so for Luke. If you do have a Bible, look down with me to the end of chapter 23, if you would. After the chaos, the the, the shouting, the mocking, the reactions we saw last week of the crucifixion scene, we read verse 46, Jesus breathed his last... But rather than then skipping on to Easter Sunday morning, Luke slows things down a little bit, doesn't he? He lingers on Jesus' followers in mourning. In chapter 23, verse 50, we meet a man called Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, a good man, it seems, who was sympathetic to Jesus' cause. He approaches Pilate for Jesus' body. And Pilate, the man ultimately responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus, at least physically speaking, hands the body over. Which, note that, he would surely not do if that body was still alive. Joseph then goes out of his way to look after what he clearly sees as a body, the body of Jesus. And and, and Joseph isn't the only one. In verse 56, where we began our reading this morning, some of Jesus' followers are preparing spices and ointments. Why? Well, to be used to stop a decaying body from smelling. The body which they knew, verse 55, has been buried The women who'd come with him from Galilee, verse 55, followed. They saw the tomb and saw how his body was laid. Can you see everyone we meet at the end of Luke chapter 23 is dealing with a body? Pilate, Joseph, the woman. Luke is making it clear that Jesus is dead. He is buried. And listen, his followers people who had more reason than anyone else in the world to wish against hope that he was still alive, they're convinced that he's dead. They're in mourning. On Good Friday, the tomb is clearly occupied. But as well as being clear that the tomb was occupied on Good Friday, it's also clear, it seems, that by Sunday morning, the tomb is empty. 
chapter 24, verse 1, the women are going back to the tomb to put spices on Jesus' body. And by verse 2, the women found the stone rolled away from the tomb, Luke tells us. But when they went in, they did not find the body of Jesus. The tomb, it seems, is empty. Now, the women, you might say, have made a mistake. They missed the body in a moment of, of hysteria through sheer grief you could argue. I mean, you'd be stretching it given that they'd seen him being buried a couple of days earlier. They knew where he was. But even if they did make a mistake, they aren't the only ones who see. There's another witness. We read later in Luke 24, verse 11, that Peter hears about the empty tomb, and he doesn't dismiss it as other disciples did. But nor does he just take it at face value and believe it's true. He runs to the tomb to see what happened for himself. Verse 12, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves. It is the equivalent, isn't it, of our old pal George Shaw checking for the stitching on a duck-billed platypus. He's examining the evidence for himself. And his conclusion, it seems, as he leaves the tomb marveling, is that Jesus has, in fact, risen. And so we have on Good Friday, Jesus physically dead and buried. And on Easter Sunday morning, the tomb empty. And the explanation given is that he has risen. And the question I think that leaves each of us with this morning is, do you really believe that? We've touched already this morning, haven't we, on the idea that the resurrection is right at the heart of the Christian faith. But you see, because it is quite so amazing, it's so extraordinary people have come up with all sorts of explanations as to what might have happened on that day. I heard someone say not too long ago that the resurrection is a metaphor, a metaphor for the hope that Jesus brought to all of his followers. And if that was true, you'd have to agree it's a pretty powerful, it's been a pretty effective metaphor, hasn't it? It's moved and inspired countless people ever since. But the truth is, you see, if the resurrection is a metaphor then I might well find it inspirational, might well find it moving. But I don't really have to, do I? I don't have to pay any attention to it at all, in fact. It's just a story. But if instead the resurrection is historical fact, as Luke clearly intends us to read it, if Jesus of Nazareth physically died on Good Friday and was physically raised from the dead... That is not something you can take or leave. You and I have to sit up and to pay attention, don't we? Everyone has to do something with the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. And my question to you this morning is, what will you do with it? Will you dismiss it as nonsense? Or will you believe? The eyewitness evidence is that on Good Friday his tomb was occupied, but by Easter Sunday the tomb was empty. We can be certain that the resurrection of Jesus Christ really did happen. That's our first point this morning. But you might well feel that that isn't an awful lot to go on. Of course I'd believe in the resurrection if I saw the physical evidence in front of me, you might think. If I saw the empty tomb with my own eyes, if I could touch the cloths as the first witnesses could. But what you're asking me to rely on, Johnny, to believe someone else's words and testimony, that just isn't enough. You aren't the first person, if that is something that's even flashed across your mind over the past few moments, you're not the first person for whom that thought has flashed through your minds. And in fact, it's an objection that Luke anticipates and we're going to think about that under our second heading this morning. It be certain that the resurrection of Jesus really happened just as Jesus said it would. Now come back with me, if you would, to the early hours of that first Easter Sunday morning uh, in Luke chapter 24, uh, where the women who have arrived to embalm the body, they're perplexed by the empty tomb, verse 4, when two men, whom we later find out are angels, appear before them. And they tell the women that Jesus isn't here because he has risen. Now, just pause for a moment and remember where it is they're all standing, where this is happening. They're standing right next to the tomb. It's a tomb which is now empty and in which lie the grave clothes in which they'd seen the body of Jesus wrapped two days earlier. 
So the physical evidence for the empty tomb is right there. It is literally feet away from them. And so what we might expect at this stage is for the angels to tell these confused and doubting and perplexed women to go and have another look for themselves, mightn't we? You know, go and have a closer look. Check the stone for yourself. Have a look at the grave clothes. Make sure they're the same ones you saw on Friday. But that isn't what they say, is it? To what do the angels appeal in order to explain what's happened? Verse 6. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. Remember what he told you and they remembered his words. Can you see the appeal is not just to the physical evidence as compelling though that evidence is. The appeal made is to words. Words that the disciples already had available to them, to Jesus' words. That should be enough to convince you, to give you certainty about what has happened, say the angels. Isn't that surprising? And I wonder if you can see how it starts to address this kind of objection that says, I need more evidence if I'm going to believe in the resurrection. You see, when we read the New Testament, we read eyewitness historical accounts of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. We've already thought about that together this morning, haven't we? Luke is a careful historian writing an ordered account of the resurrection. And so for us, well, the words and the evidence, they are one and the same thing. And if anything, that means that Luke 24 might apply more sharply to us than to those first disciples. Perhaps you've been thinking about the Christian faith for a while, but you feel you just need more evidence. You've got a few more questions to have answered before you'll commit to following Jesus. If that is you, it's worth saying that it is a good thing to, to, to want to wrestle with the evidence. The Christian faith is not a blind leap in the dark. But Luke's point is that what you're holding in your hand right now, presuming you have a Bible somewhere on your person, what you're holding in your hand right now is enough evidence to go on. So the Old Testament, written hundreds, even thousands of years before Jesus, spoke so clearly of all that he would do. The New Testament gives us eyewitness accounts of what he did do, what he did accomplish, and the impact of that, which was extraordinary. And so if you're not sure what you think about Jesus, can I encourage you as you think about wrestling with evidence to go to source material, to carefully and thoughtfully read the Bible for yourself. If you've never read it before and you aren't sure where to start, a good place might be to read through the rest of this account we've been thinking of this morning, Luke's account of Jesus' life. Finds out, find out what it really says about Jesus. If you want someone to read it with, I know that can be quite a scary prospect for some of us. If you want someone to read it with, we would love to do that. Either me or someone else in the church family would love to read through Luke's gospel with you. Please uh, come and speak to me after the service if that is you. Perhaps though you're here today and, and, and you do already believe in the resurrection, you're a convinced Christian already, there are a couple of really strong lines of application of this idea to convinced Christians too, I think. The first of which is certainty. It is confirmation of the decision you've already made if you're a Christian. What you have come to believe really is true. That when you stake your life on the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you are not taking a punt in the dark. That it is safe ground. It is the safest of safe ground. That's one implication of Luke chapter 24, the certainty of what you already believe. Secondly, there is an implication for what we do with the news we've already believed. As a church family, we, we often think about Jesus' call to, to make disciples of all nations, to tell other people the good news about Jesus. It's part of our, our mission statement as a church, actually part of what we exist to do. But I do wonder, do you always feel equipped for that job? When you think of talking to a colleague or a friend about Jesus, 
even if you think it's something you should do, well, you can quickly talk yourself out of it, can't you? Because we just don't feel like we have the resources. You know, the, 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 the debating skill or the, or the quick thinking, we aren't persuasive enough, we aren't impressive enough for someone to agree with us. Well, if that is you, please just take a moment and remember Luke chapter 24, where these women were confronted with physical evidence for the resurrection. The physical empty tomb on Easter Sunday morning was only a few feet away. The evidence doesn't get much more concrete than that, does it? But the angels don't just appeal to the physical evidence to convince them of what's happened. They, can, they, 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 they um, refer to, they appeal to Jesus' words. And so as you think about telling other people about Jesus and perhaps feel fearful at the prospect of doing that, well, you can be certain that you do have all the materials you will ever need in your hand right now. Words about Jesus, words of Jesus, the good news of his death and resurrection from the dead, which says the Apostle Paul, is the power of God for the salvation of all who would believe. Notice that. Paul doesn't say that the resurrection of Jesus or the, the good news about Jesus is about the power of God. He says it is the power of God. You can be certain of it. That's Luke's second point for us this morning. Now, so far we've spent all of our time really thinking about the fact of the resurrection, the, the, the certainty, the evidential certainty that we can have about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But you might well be thinking, well, let me put it quite bluntly, so what? So what? I mean, apart from being extraordinary and maybe acting as a signpost to the fact that something unusual was going on, why does the resurrection really matter? 2,000 years later, to people on the other side of the world, people like us, why is it such a big deal? Well, that is our final point this morning. Be certain that the cross and resurrection had to happen and that they change everything. Third and final time, we're going to return to that first Easter Sunday morning. As the women find the stone rolled away and the body gone, they're perplexed, completely thrown by what they've seen. Notice again what the angels say to the woman. Verse 6, Remember how Jesus told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. The idea isn't just that the cross and resurrection did happen nor even that they happened just as Jesus said they would happen. So this is a kind of fulfillment type thing. The angels say that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ had to happen. The Son of Man must be delivered. That same idea is repeated through Luke 24, twice more, through the next block and the final block of Luke chapter 24. Why is it necessary? Why must it happen? Comes the question. And that begs a further question, why? Why did they have to happen? Well, Jesus spent a great deal of his life explaining why the death and resurrection of himself, this person he calls the Son of Man, his own name for himself, why that would be necessary. So just before he was crucified, for example, Luke recounts a very famous scene in Jesus' life that we might call the Last Supper. And the picture that Jesus used during that supper, that final meal Jesus had with his followers, was the Passover. Now, we've been thinking about the Passover very recently on Sunday mornings here at Hebron. We've been studying the book of Exodus. Because in the book of Exodus, the pharaoh of Egypt, the leader, the king over Egypt, he had thumbed his nose at God. He had refused to listen to him. He'd rejected what God had to say. And eventually, God had promised that his judgment would fall on every house in Egypt for their failure to listen to him. And that only those whose houses had been painted with the blood of a lamb would be rescued or would be passed over by that judgment. A lamb would die so that people could go free. And again, we've seen in our series in Exodus that that is the story not just of one group of people a long time ago in the Exodus. It's the story of all of humanity. That all people, 
since Adam and Eve, every one of us have ignored God, just as Pharaoh did, have made ourselves, not him, kings and queens of our own lives. And he should rightly hold humanity to account for our rejection of him. And yet all through the Bible, God had promised that he would send another Passover lamb, a substitute, one who would bear that judgment in humanity's place in order that that judgment could pass over God's people. Now, at the Last Supper, Jesus claimed that he was that promised substitute. He was that Passover lamb. He would die to rescue people for himself. But just put yourselves for a moment in the shoes of his disciples as they reflect on that death on the first Easter Sunday morning. How can they really be sure that it worked? I mean, he said it was going to work, but how can we be sure? How can we be sure that Jesus really was rescuing people by his death on the cross? Well, behold the empty tomb. That's how they could be sure. The resurrection is the guarantee. It is an objective proof that Jesus' substitution worked. That that judgment that should have fallen upon them had instead been paid for. That a rescue had been secured. Can you see, the cross and the resurrection didn't just happen. It had to happen. It had to happen to secure a rescue, to deal with sin, humanity's rebellion against God, just as God had always promised he would do. And it had to happen for one final reason, not only to deal with human sin, but in order to defeat death, And that much is woven into this resurrection account, I think. Think for a moment of the woman at the tomb. There is a a, a realism, a real sadness about their behavior, isn't there? The care that they clearly take over the body, the preparation of spices, their arrival there first thing on the Sunday morning to embalm the body. They are clearly in mourning. And in that context, think again of the question that the angels ask them as they arrive at the empty tomb, as they stand perplexed. Verse 5, why do you seek the living among the dead? Now, not only is that incredibly insensitive, it actually feels really unfair on the woman, doesn't it? I mean, they weren't seeking the living among the dead. That wasn't what they'd come to do. As far as they were concerned, Jesus was dead. They'd literally seen him being buried in a tomb on Good Friday. But can you see the fact that Jesus was not dead, that the tomb is empty, that he is alive? It is a sign that death's grip on humanity has been loosened. Luke explains this more fully in the sequel to his gospel account in the book of Acts. He says there that God the Father raised Jesus up, listen to what he says, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Jesus' resurrection marks the beginning of the end for death. Death, if you like, has been served its notice. Now, please don't mishear me. Because even as Christians, death still hurts. It hurts because it is not how things are ultimately meant to be. But if you are a Christian here this morning, the resurrection is the most wonderful comfort It marks the beginning of the end for death. It has loosened its cords. And listen, it will one day be done away with altogether. Death will be no more, tells us uh, Revelation. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. If you are a Christian this morning, that is what Jesus' death and resurrection has accomplished for you. That is why it had to happen. One, sin and judgment paid for, done. Two, the bonds of death loosened and one day done away with altogether. You can be absolutely cast iron certain of it. Praise God for that this morning. Now, perhaps you're here and and wouldn't describe yourself as a Christian. Again, you are so, so welcome. Please come back Sunday by Sunday. We would love to have you. Maybe this is a bit different from your view of Jesus. Perhaps your view of Jesus is that he was a good teacher Uh, He was a kind man. His death was sad, as is the death of, of any peaceful martyr. But there's nothing more to it than that. 
Well, if that is you, let me firstly say that I hope you can see that isn't how he or the first witnesses understood his death. And secondly, let me be so bold as to ask you this morning, what certainty do you have about the end of your own life? Is death, as it is for many people, just a big bleak question mark that awaits you at the end of your three score years and ten? You see, it needn't be. It just needn't be. The physical death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is objective proof that he has secured a rescue, a rescue from judgment, and it is proof that death has been served its notice. And that means that you can walk in real certainty when it comes to matters eternal, to sin and to death, by trusting in this resurrected Jesus Christ in his death on your behalf and his rising to life again. He is not here, but he has risen. They are wonderful words. They're wonderful words because they're true words. And because they are, they change absolutely everything. Let's praise him for that together now. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you and we praise you for the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We thank you that it is an historical event, that it really did happen. And we thank you that because it's a historical event, that it is profoundly meaningful as the key event, the hinge point in all of human history, and as a hinge point in each and every one of our lives. We ask that for those who have yet to trust in you, who have yet to believe in the resurrection, you would please convince us of the truth of it this morning. And for those of us who have believed, help us to believe with even greater certainty and so to rejoice. We ask all these things for our joy and for your glory and do so in Jesus' name. Amen.